Hi, this is Pete Morris. This is uh, Thursday evening, uh, July 7th, and we're doing a Zoom session on the 10 best things you need to know about flying a Comanche if you're new to Comanche piloting. Uh, the list is longer than 10, but we're going to cut it to 10 and then maybe go further than that. But other than that, here we are. You're free to unmute and talk. Yeah, so this is just the... Go ahead. TJ, can you see me or hear me? I can hear you. And uh, I don't yet see you, okay. but your voice is the really critical thing right now because we usually end up with uh, 50 to 170 pilots, so you can't see everybody at the same time anyway. Got it. Oh, I love high tech when it works. You're on. Hey, Pete. Hi. How do you want to start this? We are already, uh, we are running at this point, we're recording, and yep. this is the uh, the free-for-all session, 7.30 is when we'll get down to serious business. <clears throat> but, um, yep, but Andy, Davey, just for starters, why don't you say um, who you are, where you are, what you fly, and then a little bit, uh, just to lead off on the four, at least four current Comanche drivers that you helped uh, to get introduced to the Comanches. All right, my name is Andrew Davey. I'm based at Sullivan County Airport. That's Mike, Shara, Victor. Uh, I've owned a PA24180 for at least 20 years. Uh, it's a late 62 model. And believe it or not, Maurice Taylor actually helped me get it. Um, I'm just retired from the elevator trade after 40 years. And I've had an airplane of one sort or another for 40. Um, and um, I'm not an A&P, but I do an awful lot of work at the airport on airplanes. Nice. And if I recall, you had four people you introduced to the Comanche that ended up buying them? Uh, well, one of the gentlemen, the latest, was a gentleman named of, uh, George Wardley. He's a, uh, oh my goodness, maybe 81 years old. He had lost his medical. His Comanche had sat um, at... Greenwood Lake Airport, that's I think four November 1, for nine years, unused. He would go there once in a while and start it. And he got his medical back. So uh, we worked with the FAA out of Teterboro. And uh, we were able to secure a ferry permit. And was able to get that one all the way up to um, Sullivan County Airport, where I'm lucky to have not one, but two mechanics that are savvy with Comanches. One's uh, an IA, John Nichols, and the other one is an AMP. Frank Cosner, um, and that's where she is now, and she's just about done with a very extensive annual. So I imagine I'm going to be flying that shortly. Another is Glenn Pagano. He is a detective sergeant in the Paramus Police Department. Um, he bought um, a 1960 Comanche 180 from a gentleman that passed away. His name was Ozzy, who was, believe it or not, he was an AMP, and. Uh, we actually did no less than five tail horn ADs for free with people in the area that we knew. Um, and uh, I helped Ozzy a lot with his Comanche because he came from a warrior going to a Comanche. Uh, let's see who else now. Um, Hans Pittner, who was, believe it or not, he, Hans, is a, he's got a 1960 Comanche 180 that um, he's a CFI but I've got a lot more hours in the Comanche than he does. And uh, I work with him off and on. And uh, George Oaks, who is a retired New York State trooper, um, picked up a 1962 uh, Comanche 180 that needed a little bit of work. That just came out of uh, its annual with uh, um, Frank Cosner out of Sullivan County. And he's quite happy with the work and the price. And it's a really nice flying airplane. Um, there's a number of other people that are Comanche enthusiasts that, um, well, Gloria is one. Gloria, I, I've helped Gloria out a little bit. Um, and um, there's other fellas that uh, have uh, airplanes, but they've got their own uh, source of uh, mechanical people helping them out. But if they, uh, if they need anything or whatever, they're, they're free to give me a call. If I can help out, I'd be more than happy to help out. Cool. We'll end up, if you're, if you're really offering your number out, we'll stick it into the chat window, Andy. Yeah, just don't abuse me at two in the morning. 
<laughs> cool. Well, hey, everybody. Um, welcome. It's the usual. Just uh, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. And at 730, we'll start talking about top 10 tips for new community owners. Um, I'm CJ Stumpf. I'm in, uh, currently in Vermont. I fly um, uh, 180 out of either Montpelier or Vermont or Lebanon, New Hampshire, and uh, 260B out of Westerly, Rhode Island, which actually belongs to my father, second generation. Uh, anybody else? Just jump in. Ernie James with uh, PA24260 out of uh, Yucca Valley by Palm Springs, California. Welcome, Ernie. And uh, by the way, how long have you had your bird? I've had it about um, three years now and 500 hours. Whoa. That's <laughs> you win the record. Welcome and congratulations. Right. Anybody else hop in who you are, where you are, and what you fly, and how long have you had your bird? This is Robert Bismuth here in Seattle. I have a Comanche 260, a 65 model, edited since about 2014. Bob, it is a great pleasure to have you on. You and I worked in the same company eons ago, and I used to see you on the book group there. Yeah, and I knew um, your father well. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, all who you are, where you are, which fly, and how long? Anytime. I have a 1960 PA24180. Uh, looking back, uh, all of a sudden, it's been 15 years since I got it, and it was sort of bought right because it didn't have all the log books, but uh, I've filled in all the blanks since. Uh, station past Robles, California. The airplane's a pretty low time airframe, about 3,200 hours and about 300 hours on the engine and prop. So working on an interior right now. And uh, let me give everybody a piece of advice. If you think you can do your own interior, don't call me. No fun. <laughs> Oh, welcome, Stephen, and thanks for rescuing your bird and bringing her up to uh, to date. Um, anybody, who you are, where you are, what you fly, and how long you've had your bird? Hi, I'm Andy Kwong. I uh, fly out of Oakland, California, and I bought my uh, 1960 250 in January with Kristen Winter's help. Oh, smart move. Good job. Welcome. And thanks for being a Comanche driver. Glad to have you in the, in the, in the flock. Hey, guys. Matthew. Good afternoon Chime. or evening. <laughs> Chime in who you are and uh, what you need for your Comanche dogs project and when you got your bird. Sure. Matthew Smith. I'm uh, based out of uh, <clears throat> Hawthorne, California, HHR. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I met another uh, Comanche driver from Hawthorne, uh, Jim, who has a, a twin turbocharged uh, just the other day. Um, I fly a single uh, B model. And, uh, I am uh, currently in the process of upgrading my engine instruments. Uh, sorry, I missed your. Uh, wish you'd sent me that note earlier, CJ. I would have uh, would have gone with the full CGR package instead of just doing the upgrade. Um, anyway, I am also uh, curating the Comanche documentation project website over at uh, uh, PiperComanche.info, uh, where I am uh, on a quest to collect all of the service manuals and uh, parts catalogs. <coughs> POHs and uh, everything else that's uh, useful for the airframe, at least. Um, and uh, I take uh, I take any submissions you might have for any missing stuff. And uh, I apologize, Eric Jones. I think you sent me something a few weeks ago that I need to clean up and upload soon. Um, yeah, if anyone uh, if anyone has anything they want to uh, they they uh, see as missing from the site or any suggestions, feel free to uh, reach out to me. I'm on the Facebook group. I do hang around Delphi from uh, once in a while, uh, but usually email's the fastest way to get me. And that is uh, oneredjeep at gmail.com. All spelled out. I'll put it in the chat. Anyway, good afternoon. Hi, my name's <laughs> Lou. I'm, uh, I'm based in uh, Watsonville, California. I have a twin Comanche. I've had it probably 10 years. 
I've been flying Comanches on and off since 1960. And we, I get this airplane mainly to use it for Angel Flight West and uh, the Young Eagles program, but uh, I've reached an age where uh, I no longer do that. <laughs> but I still love the airplane. Lou and Laurel, welcome. And um, we will be putting on a series on flying for a reason, and uh, Angel Flight will be part of that. So I may be trying to reach you. Um, is it, if I can find you, if you wouldn't mind, po if you're able to post into the chat, uh, there's a whole series on flying for a reason, including angel flights, um, uh, coast guard auxiliary and lots like that. Uh, anyway, sorry to go on, just yeah, jump on in. Every flight, I was wondering why I was doing it, but by the time I finished the flight, I was so happy I did it. That, that speaks for itself. And Eric Jones is on here. I know. I hope he'll just jump in and talk about his bird briefly, but also just quickly say why he flies pilots for paws. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Loud and clear. <clears throat> yeah, this is Eric Jones, and uh, I do fly a 260C uh, turbo model, the uh, one that has the headwinds. Uh, just had it six years and just passed 500 hours of flying it. And I do fly a lot of pilot and paws. Uh, do it uh, probably once every two weeks or so. And those dogs, um, if anybody's ever, uh, I know there's a lot of guys on here that have done it, but the, the dogs never have a problem in flight. I've never had one with a problem in flight. And um, they're always going from the south usually, no offense to the south, uh, back up into the Midwest uh, for what I do but they're obviously going all over the country and um you know it, it's just a great way to be able to fly to meet other pilots and to uh yeah I, and i admit it's nice to fly and have a, a tax deduction at the end of the year thanks eric and welcome everybody just hop into a blank spot who you are where you are what you've got and how long you've had her Okay. <laughs> Oops. Stephen Merrill Shepherd, hop in there just because I'm going to be calling okay. on you about interiors. Um, I'm Steve Shepherd. I've uh, partnered with a gentleman on a 63 250 that we've uh, we got coming up on two years ago now. And uh, loving the airplane. I was in a flying club 20 years ago. Nine model, and that's when I fell in love with Comanche, and uh, finally, finally got the opportunity to, to to buy half of one. So really enjoying it. Good deal. And uh, Stephen proceeded to dive into his new airplane by completely doing an interior job on it, but it's amazing. So if there's time, I've asked him to keep his photos handy because they're they're jaw dropping. Um, so, and you're the only person who I've ever not heard swearing four letter words after it but the result is amazing um everybody well, just uh, oh go ahead maybe the only reason is i, I come from a, a collision repair background so i'm used to uh tearing into things and kind of kind of knew what i was in, getting myself into so it wasn't a real shock but it did require a lot of ibuprofen so <laughs> <laughs> well uh Cool. Um, everybody just hop in, but if you're interested in doing an interior refit, maybe we need to have Stephen uh, lead a discussion on doing your own because it, the result's amazing, but uh, many, many people are like, and I decided to redo my interior and don't ever do that. So I have a feeling there's a story to tell. Uh, thanks for being here and welcome. I'm going I'm to interrupt a little bit here. I've got a, uh, a PowerPoint thing on some of the uh, help requests, things like that. It's going to run on the on the share, but you're welcome to talk over it. No problem. Perfect. Uh, just jump on anybody and say who you are, where you are, what you fly, and how long have you had your bird, and maybe what you want to know. Hi, my name is Chuck. Can you hear me? Yes. Loud and clear. Hello. Okay, hey, my name is Chuck McVeigh. I uh, based out of Nut Tree, Zacago, California. Got a 1959 250. Uh, the 
first and probably only airplane I will ever own. I've been flying for 30 years, a lot of military, and now I fly uh, corporate. And uh, learning a lot, a lot off of this, so much appreciated. I am racing home right now so I can get online and, and uh, watch it instead of driving right now. So thanks. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Feel free to jump in. Hey. Hi, it's Chris Algar here from uh, from Canada again, near Toronto. Uh, fly a uh, 180 PA24, which in 2007 I completely rebuilt. First flew it in 2010. Prior to that, uh, was in a partnership with a, uh, a 250 Turbo for 20 years. So uh, I love the Comanches and uh, they're great aircraft. Welcome, Chris. And just for amusement's sake, what was your longest cross country? Uh, around the world. <laughs> <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Welcome, everybody. Just jump into a spot. Who you are, where you are, what you fly, and how long for? <laughs> All right, I'm going to call on you. Chuck McVeigh, if you're able to unmute, I would love to know where you're from, what you fly. And there's also a yeah, okay, twin. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I just introduced myself. I'm the guy that was driving. Uh, I've got a 1959 250, and I'm out of Metro. Cool, welcome, and thanks. And then who's the Chuck who's in a twin? And um, if you can, um, Daniel Jaco, if, you, if you've got a moment and I can uh, convince you to speak. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Uh, this is Daniel. I got a new phone yesterday, so uh, not sure how it's working with this Zoom, but it seems to work. It's fine. Masterful. Uh, I've got a uh, 260B. That's my second 260B. And um, I've also involved with a project 260B and uh, got my eyes on another 260B that would be a project if I happen to sell one of these. Anyway, um, glad to be here. Glad you uh, uh, host all this and looking forward to the meeting. And I'm from Colorado Springs. Cool. So you know uh, Altitude Flying. Thanks for rescuing all those 260Bs, and it's really great to know there's a resource like you in that area. So thanks for being here, and thanks for being part of the community. Absolutely. Thank you. Hi, How, uh, Donovan. This is uh, my 25th year in a 1964-180, and... Just love that and enjoying all the Zoom activities. Brilliant. Welcome, Pat. And thanks for being here. And Pat, by the way, is the uh, the guy that used to park Comanches together at Oshkosh. And so for anybody who's heard of Comanche Town, which is where we get huge groups of Comanches parking together at major air shows, uh, just want to mention that Pat is the reason, is one of the key reasons that was possible because he actually knew how to make it work. And so... Uh, we said we wanted to have a big 60th anniversary celebration, and Pat and his wife Shirley were kind enough to help it out, and that turned into Comanche Town, which is just having really great Comanche parties at the biggest air shows in the world, if they'll ever start holding them again. <laughs> um, William, Lucius, if you're willing to jump in and let us know who you are, where you are, what you fly, and when you got your bird, and forgive me if I just massacred your name. No, you got it right on. Yeah, it's uh, William Lucius, based out of Boulder City, Nevada. I got the airplane about a year and a half ago, and it's a, it's a 1962 PA24250, and uh, just got it out annual. And uh, we had a previously, as I was growing up, we grew up with uh, E104 Papa, which was a 63250 Comanche. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Well done. How about Mike Coligny? And if I just killed your name, if you're able to uh, 
jump in and say who you are, where you are, what you're flying, you, and how long for? Sure. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Uh, let's see. I've been flying Comanches for 42 years. I've had a, a twin Comanche for eh, 42 years <laughs> and about 9,000 hours in it. I'm, a, I'm in the aerospace aviation industry and uh, CFI, double I, MEI, master instructor eight times, and that's my background. Well, All I, got I can nine, say is, oh, go ahead. I got 9,000 hours in my twin Comanche. Well, all I could say is thank goodness you're here because we're bound to get into some problems here and I've got your name now jotted down to say, Mike, when we all have a big disagreement, what do you think? <laughs> thanks for joining us and thanks for being here and willing to give us your, uh, your two cents. You're welcome. Uh, the one airplane I know the best is the twin Comanche. Outstanding. Thank you. Let's see. And Comanche Terry, you've been here before. You want to just jump in and say who you are and uh, what you fly and how long for? Yes, I'm Comanche Terry. <laughs> I've had my Comanche for about five years. I've got about 100 hours on it. And somewhere in the screen, you'll see Bob Capiola. He's the one that when I decided to look for an airplane, he said he'd look for one for me, and I thought it would be months or years and in the middle of the country. And a week or two later, he said he had found one, and it was on the airport with a guy, a really nice one you see in my picture, who had taken fantastic care of it. I love the airplane. Right now, what I'm getting the fun of going through is an annual, and it's come up on time for me to have the tail done. So I'm looking for people who might have written um, directions on how to do that, or maybe local in the Southern California who could give me guidance or help in doing that. Brilliant. You're going to want to get linked up with Hans Newbert, who's a DER. Um, we're hoping to have more news on that, but uh, not quite yet. Thank you for being here. Thank you, too. And uh, thanks for mentioning Bob Capiello. Do you want to jump in, Bob, and explain how you got this fine gentleman into his Comanche 42 years ago? It wasn't too hard. Comanches are a pretty sought-after airplane. I do have a question, <laughs> though. The guy that was talking before, Terry, I believe his name was Mike. Is he also the man that was out of Hawthorne Airport here in Southern California with the twin Comanche? Uh, can you can you hear me? I don't know how this works. If it just automatically picks up, it does. Yep, yeah. just like your mic. Uh, I hear you. Okay. okay. Uh, I bought my first Comanche. I was out of uh, well. I started out of Whiteman, uh, went to Camarillo, uh, ended up at Palomar, then moved to Prescott, Arizona. Now let's see the Comanche. I got to think. Uh, I had two Comanche, two twin Comanches. I had a an, a '63 and a and a uh, it was Ron Hutter's airplane, a '66. And Hutter uh, owned a company called Hutter Racing Machines, and he built Indy race car uh, engines. He still does, actually. And oh come on, my phone is ringing in the middle of this. I just turned it off. Uh, and uh, so he. I bought that from him uh, for $32,000. It was 200 hours on it, and Hutter had completely blueprinted the engines, and I worked for Lockheed at the time. And uh, uh, one flight, and I said, this is something spectacular. Well, you know, I, I, I ended up having that, I, I sold it about uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, uh, so yeah, I had it. For, you said ahead. you were at Whiteman Airport. Do you yes. remember Jim Smith? Does that name sound familiar? No, I don't know Jim, okay. but I worked for Jim is the one. That, Jim is the one that ran his twin Comanche off the runway in 93 when his baggage door popped open. Oh, and that's what, the Comanche that I bought three years ago. Oh, wow. Well, that was way after I was there. I, I went to Whiteman in 70. Uh, and uh, I, I left uh, California, uh, not California, San Diego, uh, sorry, uh, Los Angeles area 
in 83, moved to Palomar and then ended up in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, but uh, no, I, did, I didn't know him. Uh, yeah, okay. But, but I, my 6875 was my ICS number. So long time ago. <laughs> yeah, that is. <laughs> back when you had the twin, I was flying a 180 Comanche. Uh, that goes back, I think I bought it in uh, 83. And I flew that one for 20 years, bought a 260, flew that one for 15 years, and I still have that one. And then I've got the twin now. So I've had three Comanches kind of moved up every time. I, I put more, well most done. I put, put put most of my time on uh, in the in the PA thirty, but I did have a fifty nine two fifty. Hey, mine okay. was a sixty one eight. <laughs> my first <Yeah>. command. <laughs> anyway, yeah. it, it's it. Uh, I I will not start talking about Comanches because you won't shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way, <laughs> and Terry knows it. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to mute again so I can listen. <laughs> Oh, let's see who we got here. As long as we're putting y'all on the spot, um, let me grab Doug's iPad and then Doug's iPad too. If your name is Doug, jump in and say who you are, where you are, what you fly, and uh, how long for. And uh, oh, Chris Cotton, welcome. I'm calling on you. <laughs> Don't call on me. I just did. I'm a we'll glass to the of Pinot in. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, in that case, now you really have to say who you are, where you are, what you're flying, how long for. Oh, I don't want to cut anybody off, but nope. uh, my name's uh, Chris. I'm down in Houston, Texas. I fly a uh, 1960 Piper Comanche. Uh, just spent, uh, this is sad, but three years refurbishing it. Um, and yeah, so that's me. There's a little bit more, but I'll leave it that simple. And Chris and I are going to be putting together an air conditioning group by at some point, which is running off of electricity. So pretty <laughs> exciting. I haven't forgotten. Yeah. It's so nice. <laughs> I promise you. I'm loving it. And if a Houston guy says that, it's got to be good. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, if your name is Doug, and I see two of you identified that way, hop in and say who you are, where you are, what you're flying, for how long for. <coughs> that assumes you can find the unmute button, which is not always trivial on these. All right, I'm giving you a pass, but... Uh, um, Meister, Hans Meister, if you wouldn't mind just dropping in and saying your background and duration and thanks for being here okay Hans Newberg just got back from the airport and uh, here I am um, I think last week I mentioned something about a, um, a twin Comanche in Minneapolis a problem with uh, exhaust erosion that's and what I'm going to do is uh, put something together for the uh, uh, Delphi forum. And the things I want to show are there's an Australian uh, report that was uh, issued a number of years ago about the same problem. Um, my son Eric made me some uh, uh, gaskets for those uh, two panels one on each side and uh, I think I'm going to I've scanned my uh, bent exhaust stacks uh, and I think but on, on my 337 I think I'm going to put that because uh, having those bent exhaust stacks uh, really gets rid of the problem just in case you have it right I have a very twin. good deal 64 twin and away we go Brilliant. And uh, Hans is a DER as well as a Twinkie driver and probably one of the best twin efficient efficiency experts on the planet and has given a lot to uh, all of us to keep us flying safely and efficiently. So thanks for being here, Hans. Yeah. Um, Pete, I'm going to turn it over to you because it's 730. Okay, I've got a little bit of uh, work here to do, so give me another minute. Roger okay. that. 
It's Doug Ingham here. I'm one of the Dougs. I think I found the unmute button. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, you did it, and welcome. Okay, excellent. Um, I've been flying about 50 years out of Yorkton, Saskatchewan, Canada, and uh, but uh, relatively new to the Twin Comanche. A uh, um, friend and I bought one about three years ago, so it's got a couple hundred hours in it, just kind of getting used to the airplane, and I'm, I'm hoping to learn a few things about flying it. Well, welcome, and thanks for being here, and uh, welcome to the Comanche Driving Group. Thank you. Um, Mike Laney here. I found you by accident. How how do I uh, how do I find out when these meetings are happening? Like I said, I've got a long time in Comanches, and uh, uh, I, I, everything that can happen to a person in the Comanches happened <laughs> to me. So. So I've had icing. I've had the the, t the stabilator vibrating. I've I've really spent a lot of time in Comanche. So if I can assist in any way, I'd be glad to. I am also the FAA uh, safety team representative here in Prescott, uh, and and I I I just fell upon this. I had no idea this existed. So if I can help in any way, just let me know. Oh boy. Well, I am going to take a quick moment out of this to just um, say that, Mike, you are brilliant. So you're, you're the FAST team rep for which area? Prescott, Arizona, PRC, KPRC. Great. I'm the, so, I'm the mm -hmm. lead FAST team rep. So, you know, this is what happens when you have been doing this for 52 years. Uh, you rise to the top whether you want to or not. Or, or the bottom, or whatever it is. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. But the command oh is God. some. It's 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 been a passion of my life. Uh, I had a two ten before that. I had a turbo two ten, and I had to sell it. Uh, and and I ended up with this twin Comanche, and I couldn't believe it. It was it, it was just like a marriage made in heaven. I love the airplane. Well, uh, to answer your question, oh, go ahead, whoever was going to respond to Mike before I jump in. Uh, this is Tom LeCompte. I was just going to say that given all that's happened to him, I'm surprised he's still with the Comanche. Uh, but um, that said, I'm, I'm glad he is because it's a great airplane. And Tom, why don't you introduce yourself? Because you're someone that I've been uh, hankering to introduce anyways, and then I'll get back to Mike and answer his question. Go ahead. Uh -oh. Well, I'm not much, but uh, I own a 62, 250. I have about 1,500 hours on it and use it for all kinds of stuff. Um, and I just think it's a great airplane. Um, I fly with a lot of Bonanza guys, and Bonanzas are a great airplane, but you don't have, you can spend about a quarter as much and get a Comanche, and it's just the same. <laughs> and, you, and you can go faster than them. That is the truth. <laughs> and Hans Newbert got told off at his twin for overtaking a Cessna Conquest. So if you really want to know what you can soup them up <laughs> to do, there you go. Um, so Tom, welcome. And at some point, we are going to end up with a formation flying group, and it is going to be because of Tom LeCompte. So, and Chuck, nice screen. We like it. So Mike, to answer your question about these Comanche Zooms, they happen every Thursday night. They are always using the exact same join information, so you can literally save the information. Everybody can save the information you joined with tonight. You can use it again and again. And um, everybody is welcome. You can belong to any organization or no organization. Uh, the reason I particularly took attention to you, the fact that you're the FAST team uh, manager for your region is that we have been assisted by two other FAST teams and they really, uh, their encouragement and support meant a lot to us as we were putting these together. Uh, because we do have primarily a safety focus, we're really focused on things that improve safety, efficiency, safe flying and enjoyment. So um, that those are always the watchwords. If anybody has a topic that they would like to see brought up, whether it's just something fantastic you've discovered that you think other Comanche owners might not want to know about, um, or a particular area of regulations that uh, that you think will benefit all all safety all Comanche pilots, just uh, send an email 
to les.thomas at gmail.com who's collecting them into a giant list of topics and we will do our very best to bring them to you. Um, does that, uh, and, so, and so we probably will be reaching out to you because um, some of these are WINGS eligible. We've been so busy that we haven't actually had chance to finish running our large list by the, uh, the FAST teams to see which ones make sense and which ones don't. And we apologize for that, but they, uh, they, there are, you know, there is an intent and, and, and one of them a little bit earlier was approved for, uh, for uh, WINGS credit. And, when the, and that can get you a 5% discount off your insurance rates. And if anybody's been looking at insurance rates in the crazy market we're in right now, 5% uh, is becoming sadly an increasingly large number. So if you can go to FAA.gov and join the WINGS program and then once we uh, have a little more time, we think that many of these Comanche Zooms will get you WINGS credit and that uh, makes your insurance company like you better because it shows a commitment to, to training and safety. Okay, I'm going to take over here for a moment. Uh, you know, we're, we're run, booking headwind. We're five minutes late. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute everybody right now so that uh, we don't get any uh, crosstalk going on. The, uh, the program tonight is uh, the 10... Uh, tips for new Comanche or new pilots of Comanches. Uh, we all know that every Comanche has a little uh, idiosyncrasies on some of the things that we do try to do with them. They are not the same as a regular Piper or a Cessna or even a Mooney. So we, uh, what we did was put together this list of things. CJ, I'm not sure if you want me to run that thing, but or you're going to do it, but we'll go with that. I'm going to share it at this point, and I would suggest everybody you go to the speaker view. That way you can see the share thing with no problem and you'll be able to see whoever is talking. Okay, here we go. Speaker view and share screen. Now. Really good. Thank you, Pete. Alrighty, so just a quick introduction to the topic, and then I want to introduce one person who's going to be speaking to part of this, and then we'll go on and dive in. So uh, this whole concept uh, came out of one Ross DeFranco, uh, a young new Comanche driver who walked into uh, a tent I was minding and said, you know, we, we need a top 10 list for new Comanche owners. And so we literally sat right down on the spot, whacked it out, ended up with 14. Ran it by a couple of people, and the, the draft that you're about to see was born. Uh, just a little disclaimer, this is not intended to be professional advice. It doesn't replace your CFI's advice, your POH's advice, or anything else. But uh, it is a list of things that if you're coming in from another type of aircraft, uh, you, you probably want to know, and, and it's compiled out of the things people wish they had known. Um, that said, I just want to introduce Malcolm Dickinson, uh, who I think is with us right now because he's going to be speaking to a section on uh, airspeeds and being able to, to use a certain section of your POH later on. Malcolm, if you're there, can you just do a quick introduction of who you are, where you are, and uh, what you fly? Yes, uh, I am here. Thanks, CJ. And uh, I've uh, had my Comanche for 25 years and uh, have been a CFI uh, for that same amount of time. Actually, this, the CFI uh, certificate and the Comanche both arrived in the same year, uh, 25 years ago. And I've, I've gotten over the last, I would say, six or seven years to uh, instruct at the CPPP programs, uh, which some of you may have heard of or attended, which stands for a Comanche Pilot Proficiency Program. It's a two-day program typically put on uh, on a Saturday and Sunday uh, involves a lot of classroom sessions, a flight uh, with, a, with a Comanche experienced flight instructor, and uh, a lot of time spent with an expert, uh, a mechanic who's an expert at maintaining Comanches. Uh, so if uh, you ever get a chance to attend one of those workshops, I highly recommend it. Uh, the first time I attended one, I learned an enormous amount and uh, it, you get a, a ton of information in those two days. So. Some of the people who attend have been loaned their Comanche for a long time, like some of you. Other people attend these courses because uh, they're brand new to the type and they want to learn as much as they can about it uh, right off the bat. Good deal. Thanks, Malcolm. 
And uh, so, Pete, we can uh, just a quick clarification. It is August sixth, not August seventh. We uh, we're only sure. unless unless you're in Australia or New Zealand or other parts of Asia, in which case it isn't. It is August seventh, but it's Friday. I apologize. Like, I was talking to my daughter, and she's on the other side of the dateline. Oh, cool. <laughs> Alrighty, next slide, Pete. Thanks a lot. Okay, so. And the, the structure here is that uh, Pete's going to run a timer, and uh, I'm just going to read this, a quick background on why, we, why it was chosen to put on there, and then we'll just do Q&A or, or comments. Uh, so Comanches, their <clears throat> mains and oxes, uh, they, the Comanches have two to six tanks in general, and their mains and oxes are fuel bladders. They're not metal tanks. Uh, and so they can dry out, and when they dry out, which is typically on the top, they get pinhole leaks. And then you get to try to get your fuel, your uh, bladder out and get another one put in, which is uh, not the worst job of the things that can happen to your Comanche, but it's a pain in the neck and it's moderately expensive. So when you park your bird, leave your tanks full so that your fuel bladders stay hydrated. Now I will say, this prompted a question, how full do they have to be to be okay? And somebody came back and said, well, how many of you are still flying with your original 50 to 60 year old tanks? And the answer is a lot. So it's not a thing where if you're going to be leaving tomorrow and you have you want to go out with so much luggage or so many people that you're you're going to have to siphon your tanks the next day. No, you can you can leave your tanks down a little bit the night the night before and then fly out the next day and not have to siphon your tanks. But if you let if you leave your tanks empty or let them get low and leave them. Be aware of the fact that you are your fuel bladders may dry out and get little pinholes and start to leak. I'm going to shut up and let people jump in and ask questions or make comments on their experiences with this. So I may want to start. Um, I've got a, a four four tank uh, Comanche, and I've replaced one of the four uh, bladders, and the other ones, at least two of them, have these leaks, and uh, I. Unfortunately, my plane's been stored outside these last 25 years, so the sun beats down on the tops of the wings, and that can't be helping the situation any. And I keep, I, I will keep some fuel in the tanks, but I don't generally keep my aux tanks uh, topped off uh, because that's not really an option for me given how many people I'm likely to have on my next flight. So I, I can tell you a couple things that happen and some of these may ring bells uh, with some of you. If you uh, fly the airplane and have no problems uh, with fuel smell and then you get down into the flare and when you're flaring to land, suddenly your passengers start uh, to comment on the sudden smell of fuel in the cabin. That is fuel that has leaked out of the tanks into the wings and is the fumes are suddenly being sucked into the cabin because when you flare for a landing, you raise the angle of attack of the wing and you create a high pressure area underneath the landing gear wells and that pushes air from the inside of the wing into the cabin. And so that's oftentimes your first clue that you've got some fuel leakage. And the most common, I think, way of having a fuel leakage that causes that smell is the pinholes in the top of the, the bladders. Uh, having the bladder replaced is a, is a time consuming job. I think I remember um, Cliff saying it's an eight hour job, but I could be wrong. It reminds taking it, is that, Pete, is it less than that? Have you had it done? Mine was uh, about two and a half hours for mine. Uh, okay. Just at the one main tank. So maybe it's okay. So somewhere in between there, but it involves removing the old tank and oftentimes the old bladder has become so hard that it's like uh, hard plastic and it actually has to be cut and destroyed in order to pull it out. It's not flexible anymore after all these years. They pull that out and then after it's pulled out, they have to clean out all the old bits of it and then they have to laboriously put special tape over all of the ribs or other things protrusions into the bay and then they have to put the new tank in and these these are not flexible uh, like the rubber uh, in uh, I don't know a water bag these are heavy uh, they're, they're called flexible rubber tanks but they're not very flexible at all and so they really have to manhandle them in there and it's it's quite a job and then they snap I believe there's a snap at each of the four corners of the bag to hold it upright Anyway, uh, there's one, so there's a couple things that will happen. If you have these pinholes in the top of your tanks, 
uh, you cannot fill your tanks all the way up and then you won't get leakage. And if you find that you, f that you have a blue fuel link leak uh, showing up at your wing route, but only when you've had the plane totally topped off, that is a clue that you've got these, uh, these pinhole leaks. That is the second clue besides the, um, the smell upon landing. And the other thing I wanted to say is that once this starts, you don't have to replace the tank right away. But as someone who has postponed far beyond when I should have replacing the tanks, I can tell you that as the rubber degrades, the, the space where those pinholes are, are cr being created, you're getting little tiny bits of, of de degraded rubber falling into the tank and they go into the fuel system and they go through the fuel system and then suddenly you find you're having to pay your mechanic to remove and clean your fuel injectors again and again and again. Each time you go flying or every third or fourth or fifth time you go flying, you end up with a hot cylinder or a cold cylinder and you have it looked at and it's, it's the little bits of grit that have come from the decaying uh, fuel cell that are clogging your injectors. So something that's better to replace sooner rather than later. The, uh, the tank that I had to replace when we pulled it out, I, again, I was, t I was getting the smell when I was landing and, uh, and the flare. Uh, when we pulled the tank out, though, that place where the rib goes from the front to the back of the wing, right near where the uh, fuel uh, port is, the, the fuel fill port, there's uh, that rib was scraping on the top of the tank and created a slit, and that slit was the source of the leak. Yeah, so they take a lot of time taping up those uh, those empty bays before they put the new expensive bladder in there. Yep. Uh, if you are having this done, uh, they have to take out the whole oval uh, access port. Uh, if you if you attend a CPPP, you'll see f uh, photos of, of this job in progress. Um, and you might actually also be able to see a video of it if you go to Cliff Wilewski's uh, website, Heritage Arrow. Uh, not his website, but rather his YouTube channel. I believe he has, he has a bunch of interesting uh, YouTube videos about Comanche maintenance, and I believe one of them deals with this. Uh, if you're having these replaced, that is a good time if you've been thinking about having your uh, tank floats, which feed the information to your fuel gauges. If you're th having, been thinking about having those replaced or refurbished, that's an ideal time to do that. Good deal. And I'm just going to read a couple of the comments because there's great comments going into the chat window. And everybody, uh, the, the chat window is in different places on different devices, but if you're able to uh, find that, great. If not, I'll be reading these out. And um, so, Pat Kiefer, do you want to just go ahead and, and read in what you said because it's critical? <laughs> if not, I'm just going to get in. Pat noted that the POH says it's okay for 10 days, but we always top after every flight. And Pat is, uh, you know, the, she's, she's got an enormous amount of time also in Twin Command. She's having won the longest round the world uh, race in hers with her mother. Uh, she said they lost all four tanks to pinholes after a shop left them down during engine overhaul with a downtime of eight weeks. Uh, <laughs> she also notes they claim they were Comanche knowledgeable and they're no longer in business. But that's how, very helpful that, you know, the POH may say 10 days. Everybody that I know has always said, keep your bladder, keep your, uh, your tanks full so your bladders are lubricated. If you have tip tanks, uh, by the way, those are metal tanks, so you can go ahead and leave those open, uh, empty, um, but anything that's got a bladder needs to be full. Um, AW added that the cork gasket on the fill port also shrinks over time and can allow vapors to vent to the wing and cabin. So uh, very helpful to know that there's other sources. Um, Anybody want to jump in with experiences? And uh, Pete, how are we doing for time? Fine. Do you, you, you want to switch now or do you go just fine? Uh, nope. I want to give people a chance to jump in if they have anything to comment about fuel bladders. Uh, yeah, this is Robert Klein. I've got one comment. The valve that you use to tighten down, if that has shrunk over time, the compression that you get when you pull it up won't actually seal it. So uh, if if you uh, have have a dry you know uh, cap, 
that will also uh, cause it to leak. Good one. Mike, Mike Collini, can I, can I make a comment? Sure. Please do. Sure. Uh, I, I, well, let, let me, let me just put it down. 1983, 2018, uh, one of the tricks I learned was exactly what you say, leave your tanks full so your few bladders stay hydrated. So in 35 years, I never had a problem. 38 years later, they're still okay. Just by doing what you said there. Uh, the uh, the uh, comment I'm gonna make is uh, something that happened to me and, and it's really unusual. Uh, all of a sudden I was flying my Comanche and, and, and it started to backfire and all sorts of things were happening in one of my engines. And, and I brought it to the mechanics and I did everything and they wanted me to do whatever, change all the fuel bladders, change all the lines, change all of this, change all of that. And one day I was in Van Nuys and I'm talking to a mechanic and he said, did you ever have a water event? And I said, what, the, what does that mean? Did you ever have water in your gas? And I said, well, yeah, I did. And he said, your problem is the spider, uh, what is it called, spider, all of the things that come out and, and feed each cylinder. If you have water in your, in your gas tanks, and this is amazing because I was a test pilot for two years trying to figure this out because all of a sudden everything would stop, you know, would start to have a problem with an engine. He said it can get into the it can get into that those uh, valves and rust will will be put into your the, the the residence of rust will be put into your engine and you can tell because your CHT will be low and and so I learned to change uh, injectors in an hour on a ramp with my with my toolkit. Uh, because I had no idea what was going on. So so that's an experience I had that I've never heard anybody else talk about, but that happened to me. And so the main point I'm going to make is leave your tanks full so your fuel bladders stay hydrated. 38 years, I never had a problem with my bladders, ever. That's it. That is great input. Did anybody else ever have that situation with water in the fuel causing rust in the, is it the spider valve? Do you think yeah, it was, Mike? It's, yep. Yeah, it's called the spider something. I don't remember yep. the name. Say again on the spider? It's a flow divider. Thanks, yeah, Hans. that's it. Yeah, that's it. Absolutely. Yeah, did, can, can, can you hear me there? Loud and clear. Okay, good. I'm, I'm out here as user. At, at somewhere along the way, my name didn't come up as Jim Lynch. I'm an AMP CFI, 25,000 hours and whatnot. Own my PA30 for 23 years, and uh, I just finished uh, changing out the last of the four bladders, the right inboard. And uh, <clears throat> an interesting thing, yeah, this aircraft has always been hangry, and even keeping them full, sometimes other things will come along and cause them to start to leak because there are a couple different manufacturers of these bladders and they do deteriorate over time. But an interesting thing happened on this last one and that was that when I pulled the bladder out, I was, I was seeing some shrieking under the wing and I decided to go ahead and pull it out and it was still fairly supple which was uh, amazing and it was the original bladder for the aircraft but when I inspected the inside of the wing I found a rivet that was left over from the installation at Piper that had caused the leak in this bladder after it's a 1966 beam up so uh, there are other things that uh, can comically uh, cause a problem after all that time Wait, that's really interesting. So it was literally an assembly error at the factory on the assembly line. They accidentally left a rivet protruding into the bay. Yeah, evidently it was sitting there right, right where the leak was in the bladder itself on the, on the bottom. Too much. And it's never and been out before. 
Well, what's cool about it is how long that airplane flew successfully and uneventfully until that, that was found. It is amazing that it lasted yeah. that long. Yeah. And it's a real tribute to the original fuel bladders that so many of our airplanes, which are now uh, 50, about 49 to, to 62 years old, uh, have original bladders. I have heard that the newer bladders, which are a bit lighter and a little bit more supple, also don't last quite as long. So be nice to your originals and uh, keep them full and hydrated. I'm seeing some great questions in the chat window, but because we have 10, actually we have 14 of these, we are going to try to uh, wrap, the, come back to them at the end. So I'm going to take a quick look. Um, and um, because there was a Oh, and he asked yep. whether the, the problem with the degrading fuel bladder material clogging the injectors, uh, whether that happens on carbureted engines. And that was answered uh, kindly by Pat. It doesn't, it's, it's only a problem for those of us with the inject, fuel injected engines. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Okay, Pete, next slide. Here you go. All righty. So, Oops, and of course I just lost it. So turn off the electric fuel pump when idling on the ground. And there are a couple of these, as you'll note, that's 2A. And uh, Pete, go ahead to 2B for a moment, just because we're gonna talk about electric fuel pumps and we're gonna talk about carbureted engines. So Pete, I just need you to jump forward for a moment to the next slide, yep. And, right, monitor your fuel pressure gauge when switching off the electric pump in the air. Uh, so back in um, 1995, there was a tragic uh, fatal accident uh, when a, a, a actually a, a gentleman known for being a very safety-oriented, Len Saxon, was taking off out of Sheridan, Wyoming and uh, in a 250. And so this, these hints are particularly critical for the carbureted aircraft. And a little known fact is that more than half of the singles were built prior to 1962. And that meant almost all of the, you know, the majority of the singles are actually carbureted. So your, uh, so the reason for this has to do with the fact that in a carbureted engine in the Comanche, when the electric fuel pump is running, the mechanical fuel pump is uh, not getting a whole lot of cooling fuel flow. And so I'm just going to read what Zach Grant said because he is an AMP and an expert and I'm not. Um, he said the electric pump circuit bypasses the engine pump, right? Because there's the electric fuel pump or there's two, there's one in the 180s. There are two electric pumps in the, in the 250s. And, um, and then of course there's your mechanical fuel pump that's connected directly to your engine. So the electric pump circuit bypasses the engine pump. And so the fuel boils in the engine pump. And when you turn the electric pumps off, it takes a little while for the engine pump to pick up the fuel. Uh, he said, fuel injected are different. All fuel goes through both pumps as they are plumbed in series. So back to this very tragic crash, um, it was later determined because the NTSB initially was very puzzled, everything seemed to be fine, um, that it appeared that the, um, the electric, it was a hot day and high altitude and the, uh, with the electric pump on, when the pump was turned off, uh, effectively the, uh, there was a vapor lock situation that happened at relatively low altitude. As an aside, and this will get to something you will talk about later, which is if you get a new airplane, the Comanches left the factory with, with lap belts but not shoulder harnesses, the very first thing you should do is install shoulder harnesses before you do any avionics upgrades, get shoulder harnesses installed. But back to this, uh, that's the reason is A, you're, um, we, like our, we like our fuel pumps, we have lots of them for a reason, and uh, you want them to get that nice uh, cooling fuel flow. So turn off your electric fuel pumps on the ground. And when you turn them off after, you, after takeoff, because remember right before takeoff, you're gonna switch on your fuel pump and then you're gonna take off. And then once you're at a reasonable altitude, like 1500 feet, especially if you're in a carbureted 180 or 250, when you turn off your fuel pump, Watch your fuel pressure gauge, and it's not a bad idea to keep your finger on your fuel pump switch so that you can just switch back on if your fuel pressure stop, stop, starts to drop. Um, if it does start to drop, just flip that pump right back on again. Watch your fuel pressure, and you might have to do it twice but or sometimes three times, but uh, your mechanical pump will pick it up and everything will be hunky-dory. I am now going to shut up and let those with more experience talk.
Uh, I don't have a lot of expertise on this subject, but I do know that there are different models of Comanches have different arrangements of fuel, of uh, electric fuel pump and engine driven fuel pump. And it matters a lot that you know which one you've got so that you know whether your pumps are in series or in parallel and uh, whether you are supposed to have the fuel pump on for takeoff or not and, and exactly what the risks and the benefits are of having it on. Um, well, in general, I will just jump in and say one thing. This may or may not be part of your checklist, um, but for all of you who are new to the Comanches, and even for those of us who aren't, just because I know that I hadn't really thought about that this much until a couple of years ago when we started to look at the stuff, and then I was like, hey, I probably should know this. Um, Typically, you know, most of our checklists, but not all of them, I've seen those that don't have it. You know, you'll if you're going through your checklist, and you should have a checklist. And by the way, many, many Comanche drivers say, make your own checklist. Uh, you know, your, your, your last owner generally will hand you his or her checklist when you buy the airplane. But when you go through it, recheck it because, you know, Comanches evolve over time and make sure the checklist still matches your airplane. And when you do that and you update it, you'll find you know a lot more about the conscious operation of your airplane. But typically, it's you know master switch on fuel pump on check your fuel pressure so you go look over in your fuel pressure you're looking for your fuel pressure gauge to come off the peg and you're listening it's going because your electric pump's running then you turn it off and then if you're carburetor you'll prime and if you're uh, fuel injected you'll do your fuel injected procedure and then you start your engine but you're starting your engine with your electric pumps off um, that that tells you a very important thing which is that your most important pump which is your mechanical fuel pump is working um, but particularly with, where we've got people like Mike and Jim on the line and John Futter and Hans, and there are a number of others that I'm seeing here who have a lot of experience. Uh, do you want to jump in with any possible things that you think our newer pilots may want to know about their fuel pumps? Um, Pete, you want to mention this, this uh, marimba beat that a 250 has when they're working properly, or, or maybe uh, Hank Spellman? Yeah, that was his comment. Is that it, you, it, uh, you can hear the pulse of the pump but it is not, it's like a Harley Davidson. You go ka-chunk, 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 instead of chucka, 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 chucka. It's not even, it's, it's got a syncopation to it. That's because there are, in the Comanche 250, there are two pumps and they are not synonymous. <coughs> yep, so that's valuable for those of you. One, you just hear the thump, 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 and it slows down as the pressure goes up. Yep. But in the 250, you want to hear a syncopation. Think Xavier Cougat. And there's a uh, diagram in the um, Air Safety Foundation book that shows the fuel, the different fuel arrangements of different models. And that's uh, also included in the CPPP materials. That's a diagram you really need to uh, look at carefully for the, for the diagram that applies to your airplane. And I just scanned them in, and um, for those of you who were here early during the hangar flying, Matthew Aaron Smith, uh, Smith with uh, who's uh, doing the Comanche docs online, just got the scanned <laughs> versions of those 11 pages of diagrams uh, just today, in fact. So you all be able to look these up online at either uh, docs.northeastcomanche.org or uh, Matthew, do you want to just pipe up for a second and put it into the uh, chat window also? Uh, what is the link to the other link? Because it's comancheinfo.org, is it? Pipercomanche.info. Pipercomanche.info, that's right. Um, but you can go to docs.northeastcomanche.org to find all these docs online and, uh, and then what, what Matthew just said. Um, but the key things I think we just talked about are um, that this, uh, this monitoring that is particularly critical in the fuel injected, the, in other words, the 180s and the 250s. Um, it's a bit different in the, uh, in the fuel injected because those fuel pumps are not so prone to vapor lock because they're getting cooling fuel flow going in both the electric and in the mechanical fuel pumps. And that in a 180, you're going to hear a regular ticking when they turn on, and then it's going to slow down as pressure comes up. And in the 250s, because there are two pumps with a slightly different rhythm, you're listening. And if in a 250, you turn on your electric fuel pump and you only hear a single staccato beat, that may mean that one of your electric pumps is in op and you might want to get that checked out. Anybody want to jump in with uh, fuel pump stories? Uh, yeah, CJ. 
Uh, the other thing that fuel gauge is good for is uh, for watching, uh, particularly in a carburetor uh, airplane, is that you will get about 15 seconds of warning that you've run a tank dry if you watch that. Because when the car, the, the uh, fuel runs out as the uh, carburetor re uh, reserve, I don't know, carburetor bowl is, uh, uh, is filling. So there's some fuel in there. Uh, but the fuel pressure goes to zero. There's still fuel in the carburetor, but it doesn't last very long. That's super helpful. Thanks for saying that. That was Hank Spellman. Um, the reason that's especially helpful is that um, when you're really doing long distance flying, um, it, as Ron Kyle mentioned in his, his Comanche Zoom on long distance flying, uh, running a tank dry is actually a useful thing to do because you want to have one tank, especially for landing where you know you've got a pretty good amount of fuel and uh, that you are going to hear that. You're going to be able to see very, very briefly right before it goes away. Uh, you'll see that fuel pressure drop and then you're going to know you're going to want to flip off your flip on your pump and switch tanks. Anybody else? Yeah, Mark Sullivan here. Uh, I've been having a real problem getting good idle and um, Zach Grant pointed out something I'd, I'd never thought of before, but it turns out, as usual, Zach is usually right. Uh, one of my engines has a terrible idle, and unless I'm running the AUGS pump, it'll, I've had it, you know, I've had it shut down when taxing in with a hot engine. Zach suggested that during my annual that I check the fuel pressure by plumbing in the pressure gauge, and I did, and what I found is I found the fuel pressure on one engine was a nice, steady, quite low actually on the on the twin Comanche off the uh, AUGS pump and off the uh, off the engine driven pump. It's not real high pressure. Uh, however, in the other engine, I was getting was the needle was just swinging back and forth, back and forth. And Zach pointed out that um, he's seen the problem before. What happens? is the seals in the electric fuel pump over time dry out and the pump begins to suck air. Um, the other tip on it is I've had when, when the plane's in the hangar, you'll open it up, you get into the cabin the first time and you'll have a fuel smell and there are zero blue stains anywhere. Um, so it's not a, obviously a frank fuel leak. And as Zach points out when that those gaskets get dry like that. The amount that leaks is minuscule. It's enough to give you uh, to give you the vapor smell. I haven't replaced the pump yet, um, but you know all the all the indications are pointing to it. But in a million years, I'd never thought about you know sucking air through the AUGS pump, and that's the most logical explanation. Crazy. Thanks. All right, and um, Pete, go ahead. To next. Okay, so emergency gear extensions. Um, <laughs> you'll note the capital letters on the ground and how to reset the release. Uh, so the emergency gear extension in the Comanche, um, our gear is electromechanical. It is not hydraulic. And uh, so the reason you want to learn it on the ground is that um, when you do the emergency gear extension, um, and, and then you land, your gear is not locked. It is, uh, it's being held in place by your bungees, which is one of the reasons, and we'll talk about bungees a little bit later, but why people are like, nope, don't replace them every three years, do it sooner. And Hans Nieber did a very interesting study on those. But um, the other, uh, so, so when you land, when you've done the emergency gear extension, your gear is not as locked in place as it is when you're just landing normally because you've disconnected the gear motor, which is part of what, what uh, locks your gear into place when it goes down. Um, so why take the chance of having something go wrong? Um, either it's not rigged properly and you have a gear collapse or, uh, or you land um, after doing an emergency gear extension and maybe you've got gusty winds or a big crosswind and your your gear's not quite as strong and locked as it is normally and you you know you have a very expensive problem so why would you do that um, and a quick note if you do happen to do the emergency gear extension obviously do your nicest touchdown possible and then when you get off the ramp 
<laughs> make your turns gentle because again, you're not quite as locked as usual and so you don't wanna sideload your gear. Um, the reason about how to reset the release, right? Because you're gonna have to release your uh, gear transmission to do this is um, that if this does happen to you, um, not everybody and not all regular mechanics know how to reset the gear transmission release. And so you may be at some airport, not close to home, not close to your mechanic, and um, you're gonna wanna be, it's not complicated to do all, but you just do need to, do, to know how to do it. Um, in the diagram that, uh, that um, Matt Smith will be putting up on the docs.northeastcomanche.org or comancheinfo.com uh, site, that, that does have that information, but in addition, either the, the CPPP course that um, Malcolm instructs in or um, uh, George Richmond, Dennis Cruz, Zach Grant, the, the original CPPP course, which, which is also still offered, those guys actually um, will go through the whole emergency care extension process with you. It's really worth doing. And uh, we're gonna try to do a Zoom on that in the not too distant future. So right now I am posting a link uh, gear extension to the PDF uh, of the official instructions on how to reconnect a landing gear transmission after an emergency, aka manual gear extension. And uh, this document was written by Matt Kirk, who is the world's leading authority on Comanche landing gear and has dedicated a significant portion of his life to knowing, understanding, repairing, and re re designing repairs and, and uh, newer parts for Comanche landing gear. And if you haven't ever seen his site, aptly named ComancheGear.com, then uh, you should have a look at it. And this is, I think, one of the most valuable items on the on the site. So keep print this out, save it on your phone, and uh, keep it in the airplane. And then when you're on a visit to a faraway municipal airport and the local guy's never seen a Comanche before and you need to uh, reset, you'll have the instructions with you. One comment Brilliant. on that is that uh, if you happen to have you do the, the gear extension and land, your aircraft is no longer airworthy because the gear is not connected as it's supposed to be until you reset it. Absolutely. Uh, Mike Kalini here. I, I'll talk a little bit about the gear if you want to hear about some experience that I had with this gear after, you know, 38 years. Uh, is, is it okay? Yeah, if you think it'll help new Comanche drivers, we've got five sure. minutes for each topic. Sure. Uh, so I became a test pilot again when all of a sudden I couldn't get my gear to go down, but it was intermittent. And it happened over and over again. Uh, for quite a long time and nobody could figure out what was wrong. And ultimately I ended up with a guy who worked for Lockheed. I worked at Lockheed and he was, you know, this was his thing. He was a, a aerospace engineer and he came with me and he, he said, is there anything in the, in the gear mechanism uh, uh, that could cause an inter intermittent or anything like that. And so I explained the gear mechanism. And in our twin Comanches, there's a solenoid. And it's a little silver thing. And, uh, and uh, he said, that could be your problem. And, and after a year of emergency gear extensions and then going to my mechanic and have him hooking it up, uh, hooking it up uh, the way it should be, because as he said, it's not airworthy once you've done an emergency uh, gear extension. Uh, that fixed it, solenoid. So uh, if you have problems with gear extensions and you've had to put the gear down, it, it could be that problem. Uh, the other thing that happened to me was, you know, I had a lot of time on this airplane. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna think it had about 7,000 hours on the airframe. And uh, I, I had a friend of mine, his name is uh, Todd, uh, what the heck's Todd's last name? Anyway, he's part of that uh, Comanche. He went through the Comanche CPFF or whatever. And we went flying one day. He's also a DPE, young kid, really good. 
and we landed and he said, we got a problem here. I'd like to look at the gear. And we looked at the gear and here I am flying the damn thing for 20 plus years. And I thought I was an expert on stuff. And he took one look at my gear and he said, you got to have this inspected. And, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, I'm, I can't remember the name of the thing. But anyway, to make a long story short, after that amount of time, uh, I, was, I was within probably an hour of totally having my gear collapse. Every single bushing in the gear had to be replaced but the nose. I mean, this, this was unbelievable every single bushing in the gear was out of tolerance. And it was at, at the point of where if I made a sharp turn, the gear would collapse. And mm. uh, I had no idea, I'm a big ex uh, expert on Comanches, and I had no idea, none. <laughs> And, and that's and probably pretty common. There's probably a couple hundred Comanches out there right as we speak that are in the same condition as yours was at that moment. And it's because uh, there are mechanics who are doing the thousand hour gear AD. Thousand hour, that's exactly And they're right. not following Amen. the directions because they're not being careful enough and reading carefully enough to fully understand all the ramifications. You and Kristen Winter spoke about logbooks uh, on the Comanche Zoom about six weeks ago, and she said she, she can tell. Somebody sends her logbook scans of an airplane they're thinking about buying, she can go through the logbook and she'll find the entry complied with AD number, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And if that's all it says, section. if that's all it says, she says somebody took a quick look at the gear and said, all right, AD complied with. If it says complied with AD number such and such, remove this, remove that, replace this, found this out of tolerance, replace that bolt, replace that washer, replace that bushing, then she knows it was actually done properly. So there's a significant danger in taking your, your plane to the local uh, shop or to the quick quick and dirty shop to have that one done. You want that one done by somebody who's done a bunch of them before and really knows what's involved. No, knows, yep. knows the Comanche, absolutely. Right. So Matt Kirk, we do have a future Comanche gear, gear uh, Comanche Zoom scheduled. And uh, on the Zoom right now is Hans Newbert, who I affectionately refer to as Hans Meister. And Hans is the person who created the Thousand Hour Landing Gear DVD which Hans has been making available to people at cost. And it is how to do that thousand hour landing gear AD. Um, and it, it is a step-by-step -step DVD where you can literally go through and look. Um, I just had, I just actually did my first owner hampered annual. And um, so to sort of reiterate what everybody else is saying, when you get your Comanche, and this is not part of our top 10 tips, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. Try to make sure that somebody like a Kristen Winter, a Zach Grant, um, a you know a, a very experienced person, Cliff, Cliff Walewski, yep, Jinx, <laughs> has uh, has at least gone through your logbooks uh, because they will often be able to, to see the signs of that complied with where it's not correct. So in the case of the Comanche that I just was with when we did the annual, it turned out that the thousand hour gear AD was twenty two hundred hours overdue due to uh, uh, an, an incorrect entry that had been done about 25 years ago that made it look as if it had been complied with when it hadn't. Um, the, you know, so I won't, I won't go into this too much, but I do wanna just say, please do try to come. When Matt Kirk and Hans Newbert uh, come and speak, please try to come to that. They'll be talking about the thousand hour gear AD. Um, Matt in particular, it, was a little bit testy when he said the AD is a bit too general in that there are some things that really need to be looked at a little bit more often and other things that aren't really as, yeah, only 2,200 hours overdue. Yep, so it was at 3,200 hours since the last time it had been properly checked. Um, now, the funny thing was this little 180 was still, the gear was coming up, it was going down, it was coming up and it was going down. It really wasn't too terrible. And for those who are curious, uh, the bushings were all fine. The bolts all measured very slightly out of tolerance, but there was some step wear on them. And so we replaced all of those and no nose gear downlink uh, springs in 
one slightly bent, uh, uh, I forget what the part name is, but it, it's a thing that connects right up by the outside underside of the wing. And now it's uh, super, super tight and your gear should be completely tight. There should be no play whatsoever. But unless you really know the gear, uh, I, I, you know, if somebody said, go shake your gear and find out if it's good, I'd be like, I don't know, I'll, I'll call Kristen or Zach Cliff or somebody, they know how to shake the gear and tell you. Sorry to go on about this. Go ahead. Little comment on the uh, gear. And yes, please. Besides mechanical, you've got wiring. And we're, we're dealing with 50 year old wiring in these aircraft. And um, on my particular uh, Twin Comanche, I was having an intermittent um, green light. And I suspected that it was possibly the wiring. So I ordered up uh, Matt Kirk's um, new wiring for it. And as I was taking everything apart, sure enough, on the nose gear, I found that uh, I had out of the strands, maybe two strands that were still uh, connected um, for the, uh, the down light on that particular gear. And installing the new um, switches and, and wiring made it a whole new airplane. Um, having a, having a Twin Comanche, which you can stick a mirror out there and see that the nose gear is down, gives a lot of peace of mind because you know they're all bust together. So if you flip the master on and off a few times and finally get a green light, that helps. But besides looking at, um, at, at all the mechanical stuff in the gear, also look at the wiring because that's a real important uh, feature on that. Well said. And do you, um, if you know, do you want to go ahead and talk a little bit to how the Comanche gear is wired so that uh, people know? You well, won't get a green light unless it's all green. That's correct. Uh, all the switches have to be made pretty much at the, uh, at the same time. And, and it's very critical the way that uh, you have to measure the, um, how those switches make contact. It has to be on jacks and you have to have someone actually raise the, the gear to a specific um, angle and measure that angle and then set that switch. And uh, Matt's uh, instructions are very good. And uh, once you put it together, you'll be a happy camper. Do they still have the kit available that you can, Matt, uh, I hadn't heard Matt's name in a long time, uh, but he, he actually supplied me with a little kit to make all the measurements on the gear. Is that still available? I'm it is, but there's some portions of it that are missing. And so we're going to, well, maybe this would be a good time to ask. Um, if you would be willing to contribute money to get us a, a new kit, Matt mentioned that there's some things missing that we need to replace. Um, it would be, uh, it would be if, you know, and I think he said the total cost that we're going to need to put together is around, Hans, do you happen to know, is it about $800 or is it more? Uh, what part of the kit are you talking about? Um, I don't know. He was like, I know we have really super fine calipers and I'm trying to remember what else that needs to be in it. Oh, you're talking about the inspection kit. That's the one, yes. yep. Yes. Oh, well, I, I have a full full up inspection kit uh, with precision go no go gauges, a very accurate micrometer, the, uh, the pins to check the threads, and I have uh, thread tools. And I also, uh, when I check the gear, I also have a uh, um, magnetic base with a dial indicator so I can check the preload on the gear. So it, it's very complete. Oh, and I have a timing bar too. Uh, the timing bar is necessary to get the transmission in the right position. If it's too far forward, you'll hit the bulkhead when the transmission goes to the up. You'll, the, the transmission will bump into the, uh, the forward uh, shear panel and you, you won't get an up light. Uh, if it's too far back, you can damage the gear and the gear motor. Uh, I would like to make a comment on this chart number four. Um, the first comment is uh, the part that you are trying to move has all the weight of the gear on it. It's the black part, uh, the red handle lifts up and it slides the forward part of the transmission forward to open up the curve slot in the uh, 
in the drive uh, uh, in the Acme gear. All the weight of that gear now is resting on the part that has to move. So what I do is I put the Johnson bar into the rotating link or the rotating arm I call it and I lean down and I push down as hard as I can to unload as much of that weight as I can using the Johnson bar before I lift the red handle. If you try to force the red handle up with all of the weight of the gear on, the mechanism there is called a four bar link. If that mechanism gets bent, you will have a bad day. <laughs> the, the second thing about this chart is, after the gear is released, there's like a, a momentary pause, and then all of a sudden the gear will start falling down. Do not let it bang to a stop. You, put, you, hold, you keep the Johnson bar in your hand and you ease the gear down. You do not let it drop because if, it, if you let that happen, the rotating pins at the uh, drag link, they will fail. And Good point. Yep. Okay. And Hans is talking specifically to when you do this on the ground in the air, you're, 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 the literal, the fact you're moving through the air is cushioning your gear as it comes down. Sorry, Hans. Yeah, well, I, I've done about five, <laughs> five in the air myself. <laughs> it's not a big deal. Oh, dear. Yeah, yeah. And I, if I'm sitting in the co-pilot seat, I can reconnect it. Uh, yeah, you, in the air, you can do that. Absolutely. If I'm, if I'm on the co-pilot side, I can reconnect it. Oh, yeah. um, one last thing for the mechanic that's going to put it back together. After you're on jacks, the gear now is down, the motor is in the up position. You put the, the gear switch down, put the gear down, and then with the Johnson bar, you pull on it just slightly, and now the motor will operate. And you can watch the, the gear, the, the transmission and everything will move backwards, and you have, you have to eyeball it to get it to the right spot before you can reassemble. Yep. Yeah. And folks, this is being recorded. So for all of you who are like, wait, I'll never get this. You can go back through and play it and go to, you know, 827 Eastern time and you'll find this discussion. I, I, I have one, one other suggestion uh, as I'm looking at this and I'm thinking uh, the cheapest thing you can do to kind of save a gear problem is replace your bungee cords every year. Uh, is it still a two-year thing with, that they tell you? I, I I haven't thought about it. I replace them every year. But well, you got to one of our top ten tips early, uh, Mike. But I want to actually, so I'm I'm gonna just jump ahead. So Hans, would you mind answering Mike's question with a summary of the study that you did on the bungees and the amount of uh, load they take off of the gear motor? Yes, uh, this is back when I had a day job. Uh, <laughs> The distance from the roller in the wing to the roller on the gear is 23 and 38 inches. So, uh, took it into work and on a test machine, uh, we stretched to 23 and 38. A brand new bungee was a little over 250 pounds. A bungee that was that was the stretch. Now, this is in the down position. Uh, but that's the load on the bungee is 255, I think it was. Uh, one year later, we took a bungee off and, and measured that. It was about 190, I think. I, I'd have to go back. It's in the video. Uh, the two-year bungee was like... Uh, 160, I think. We didn't have one to measure a, a three-year bungee, but I will tell you that in three years, that bungee is worthless. Yep. So change them every year. They're only like $18, I think. Cheapest thing you can do to help your airplane. <laughs> now, the second thing I can answer that with is I did a study of how much force does a gear motor need to have to put the gear up? And I did it with a load cell 
in a small hydraulic jack. And for the angle of the gear, we used a, uh, a digital torpedo level. There's two of us guys doing it. Anyway, it, that was published uh, in, the, in the Comanche Flyer when I'm still a member. And uh, it's interesting. We did it bungees on and bungees off. And the difference between the two up points was 250 pounds. Wow. So, so the moral of the story, oops, sorry, is that um, just like be nice to your fuel bladder so you don't have to replace them, gear motors are expensive and they're scarce. So be nice to your gear motors, your bungees, Cost twenty dollars a pair from aircraft from Bubco, I think it is, and uh, the labor from somebody who knows how to put them on and off is about half an hour side at most, and it'll be the, the best money you spent. Yeah. I've got one comment uh, that I'm hoping I get back up from Hans on this. A little bit of Armstrong on that red ball that's between the seats also helps uh, the motor not work as hard with the gear going up and down. I always help mine along on my single. My twin, I'm not able to do that because it doesn't have the red ball between the seats anymore. Hans, That's, can you back me up on that? Uh, that is correct. Um, I can look up the chart on, uh, on that uh, study that I did, but it, it has sort of an S-shaped curve. Uh, it, the, the, the load on the gear motor starts out comes up, drops a little bit, and then it goes straight up. So by helping it, you're helping it, uh, reducing the, the load on the, on the transmission and the motor itself. So yes, it's a good idea. Uh, the second reason it's a good idea is, in case you're doing that and there's something on the floor that's getting in the way, you'll see it coming. So. Yep. And Cliff Falewski mentioned that as well in talking about the gear extension. If you're following along your, um, uh, your emergency gear extension arm, which is that thing that on not most but not all Comanches is going up and down as your gear goes up and down, if you've, it, it should feel smooth. And if it doesn't feel smooth, you may have some wear on your worm gear. Um, I think that's the most common problem, but I'm going to defer to Hans. Well, the other thing I do when I swing the gear is I have a DC ammeter, a clamp-on style. Sometimes some people call it an amp probe. Anyway, it's a clamp-on style ammeter. I put it on the ground wire so I can see the results going up as well as coming down. In the up mode on jacks, you do not want to exceed 20 amps. Now. Uh, you have a 30 amp circuit breaker, but that circuit breaker is probably 50 plus years old. And the anti-corrosion gel that they put inside the circuit breaker when it's manufactured is long gone. So another good idea to do at an annual or whenever is just replace the circuit breaker. Because you don't know when that's gonna happen when that circuit breaker fails. And how do I know? It happened to me. Um, I left uh, one airport, gear went up, I get back to my home airport, the gear wouldn't operate, so I got out of the pattern, had to do an emergency extend and then land. So, and it, what it was, was a circuit breaker. Hmm. So you heard it here first, folks, every 50 years, replace your gear motor circuit <laughs> breaker. <laughs> That's the truth. Uh, Another screws real quick. Another thing that uh, I have found helps me remember that my gear is down is I always, on about a quarter mile final, reach down and touch the red ball. If the red ball is not in the correct location, time to go around. Good one, and you're anticipating another one of the top 10 tips, which will be gumps, 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 and don't just say it. Go through <laughs> each one mindfully. Um, I, I from the a, chat window. Oh, go ahead. My tip is probably everybody knows, but you know, for for I I think I paid two dollars and ninety eight cents, but I bought a little circular mirror th 
thing that I stuck on the nacelle on the left side. And if the nose gear is down, it's pretty, you can be pretty well assured that everything's down. So I, before I land, I always look at the little mirror to see that the gear is down. And it's really cheap to make that happen. Yeah, if you have a twin or you have tip tanks, those yeah, little mirrors twin. will work. Yeah, yep. yeah. yeah. Um, does anybody have a mirror that, if I recall, there was some mirror you could buy that, that like screwed into your, that like three, you know, your, your wingtip light, the normal one? Was there something that screwed in there and stuck down that you could see from a single or stuck up? Could I throw out something? Yeah, please. Uh, a couple of things, if I may. Um, first, I do have a mirror on the pilot side on mine. It's been there ever since I've had my 69 260C for the past 31 years. So I don't know where it came from, but it's there. Um, second thought, uh, for a while I was having intermittent green lights um, and I did replace them with Matt's uh, gear harness and that got rid of the uh, the intermittent green lights. That was two years ago, I think. And and many years ago, um, the post pulled out of my battery because whoever had checked it last hadn't bothered to check the battery. So naturally this was on the night flight um, and therefore the lights go out and the gear doesn't work and the radios don't work and that's a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> happily, my instructor, you know him, CJ George was with me and uh, we had actually been up on jacks a few weeks before and I had been practicing the gear extension. So in the dark on the sea where the, um, the handle has to be pulled out and inserted in, uh, we did it successfully and kissed the ground when we came back down and everything was good ever after. <laughs> but keeping a flashlight in the plane is something I've done ever since that, as well as checking batteries and checking gear motors and good things like that. Thank you. I, I replaced that whole battery uh, uh, a container and everything. I don't know where I got it from, but it really, you know, the original thing was not very good. And the, you can go out and get a, I don't know what you call it, an aftermarket uh, replacement for it. it. It's again, cheap, but maybe well worth the money. Yeah, the, I think supplier, I... the supplier of that battery box is Bogert Aviation, B-O-G-E-R-T. Right. And he also has a lovely tool for replacing your bungees. That's right, the bungee tool. I forgot about, I forgot about the bungee tool. I got yeah. my bungee tool on eBay. It saved some money. Still works great. The old kind. Uh, CJ, this is Robert. I have one comment. There, there are, in fact, mirrors that you can buy that will extend where the wing tips connect to the end of the wing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one on both the right wing tip and the left wing tip. So it makes it a little easier to, to look at all the gear, but uh, relatively small investment. And you can put it on just, I think it's three screws aside. I've got a couple of comments, CJ. Uh, By all means. Per particularly for the new folks. Be very, very careful where you have your gear work done. Some time ago at one of the fly-ins, people went around and checked the uh, gear. Some of the parts were put on upside down. They had to be modified to fit. I don't know who the mechanic was, but I would not recommend him. That's wow. And the second is on flight instructors. Be careful about your flight instructor. And that's the experience listen. that I had. Thank you. Uh, I laid off uh, flying for a number of years to chase the, uh, raise kids, pay the mortgage, and chase the almighty dollar. Uh, as I came back to it, I knew how to fly a Comanche because I already had about 350 uh, hours in it. Uh, I just didn't know how to fly uh, and was really rusty. As we got down to the last 
you know, where I was pretty much done, the flight instructor, who happened to be a friend of mine, said, uh, well, we're going to do an emergency gear, uh, gear extension and land because you need to do one. And I said, no, we are not going to. And uh, he said, then I can't sign you off. And I said, whether you sign me off or not is immaterial to me. We will, we will not do uh, an emergency gear uh, extension and land. And we'll discuss it on the ground. Uh, so I exercised my pilot and command uh, authority. We got down and I said, number one, you have to put the airplane on jacks to reconnect it. And you know there are no jacks on this airport because we, every time there's an annual done, we have to go find some. And number two, uh, a gear collapse, excuse me again, a gear collapse is uh, most likely at this point, and I'm not going to take this airplane for the $50,000 slide uh, because if anything is out of adjustment, they're going to fold. And he said, I didn't know that. Be very careful about you know, flight instructors that know all about airplanes except Comanches. Thanks, Hank. And that actually is a, a key point um, that comes up a lot is you know, do your transition training with somebody knowledgeable in Comanches. The uh, accident statistics support that being a good idea. It's not in our top 10 list because it was a list that was compiled by pilots who were new to the Comanche who said, this is what I wish I'd known, but it's a good idea. I want to just read a few things out of the chat window because there were some really good questions and then we'll uh, save any others till the end. Um, let's see. Uh, Chuck asked, is there an instructional video CD on the emergency gear operation? Uh, you said it was mentioned. And actually, the, uh, the instructional video CD that I mentioned was the 1,000-hour gear AD DVD created by Hans Neubert and another gentleman. Um, that one is the one you want to have for your A&P, uh, especially if you happen to, to be working with an A&P who hasn't done those 1,000-hour gear ADs before. Um, getting that DVD is really strongly recommended. And um, Hans has been making them and making them available to Comanche Town um, and has also been making them available to, uh, to Northeast. The ICS also sells them. And so those are some of the places you can get them from. Um, and uh, if you need one and you can find the chat window, go ahead and post. Um, for now, I'm just going to say if you need one and you want to get one, um, just send an email to, uh, and I'll say this just because it's easy to remember, les.thomas at gmail.com, and he'll collect those requests and we'll coordinate with Hans. Um, as far as an instructional video on the emergency gear extension operation, I would, I have not checked YouTube. Does anybody know, before I go into the other questions and then move on to the next one, does anybody know of a good instructional video on the emergency gear extension. The one caution I have is it is not the same in all Comanches. As John Futter just mentioned, the person in the 260C, in the C, the little thing that goes up and down on the floor isn't there. You have, when you lift the panel to get to your, uh, to the thing that will release your gear motor transmission so you can do the emergency extension, that's where your little bar is and you insert it into the thing on the floor. And, uh, and so I, when I ask if there's an, an instructional video, it's going to need to be specific to a type. But does anybody know if there's one on YouTube or anything? I just looked and there is uh, the uh, website of Heritage Aero. So if you go to YouTube and you type in Heritage Aero, that's A-E-R-O, uh, you'll find several videos. There isn't one specifically on the emergency gear extension, but there is a video on normal, showing normal and emergency gear extensions in a PA-30. Uh, which is going to be pretty much the same as the 24. Um, and I will put the link up right now. Great. And folks, um, there's a bunch of really useful links that are going into the chat window. That information will be captured. So there's a number of people just dialed in. 
And by the way, if you're dialed in, you can text a question to 617-816-8766 and we'll get it answered. But the chat window will be posted with the video. Um, the, uh, the next, um, so, that, so Chuck, I'm afraid that it looks like we don't have what you're looking for, and I didn't, and I'm sorry about the confusion. The uh, thousand hour gear AD is to help you and your A and P understand how to properly do that AD. Um, the uh, uh, John Futter, would would you be willing to have us get with you and George and create just to shoot a, a video on your iPhone of doing it in the C, so that we've got a complete set? We could do that. I don't think it would be immediately, but we could do that. All righty. John's good for it. So at some point, we will be posting an instructional video on how to do the emergency gear extension in the C on uh, northeastcomanche.org under the Comanche Zooms. Could um, I throw out one last thing to look for? Yes. That we had seen mm, a couple of years ago at the top of the main landing gear on the C, I don't know about others. I would guess it might be the same. There are two pins that hold the whole landing gear in place. They look like bolts, but they're really pins going in there. And they are safety wired together, which holds them in uh, so they don't fall out. Uh, at that time in doing a, uh, a strut replacement on one side, we looked and, and couldn't decide which way we're putting it in, said, well, we'll go look on the other side. Well, on looking on the other side, I found there was no safety wire holding the two pins in place. So I don't know how many years that was in place like that. Um, I don't know why they didn't fall out and the whole landing gear fall off. But that would be <laughs> something to look for, would be safety wire at the top of the landing gear. Yeah. Uh, sure. Good one. John yeah. McGowan had an excellent suggestion. Um, <laughs> Many an iPad has been crushed by having that thing come down and squish it. So he said, uh, make sure part of your free landing checklist is that that area that that thing is going to swing onto and squish onto the floor is clear. Uh, you don't want to block your gear from operating and you don't want to kill anything that's underneath that bar when it comes down. Uh, so Please, John McGowan, AJ, go ahead. This, this is John. Uh, the second part of that challenge is that you can also opt the circuit breaker uh, or or burn the motor out or wreck the transmission if you've got something bulkier than an iPad sitting on the floor, like a thermos or, or something like that. So mm -hmm. clearing, clearing that floor space, <clears throat> which is real handy, but it's not a good place to store things before takeoff. Uh, Malcolm, yep. I would add that it's uh, uh, very uh, noisy too when it's your rear passenger's foot. It does. <laughs> um, uh, one, one other thing on the uh, 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 videotape or DVD for the um, uh, landing gear, that is part of the Maurice, uh, Maurice Taylor series of uh, videos that was put out and is available from that organization that uh, a lot of people no longer belong to. Maurice Taylor was a friend of mine for 25 years. Let me let me tell you, there's a guy who knew a Comanche. He saved me so many times. Good Lord. He saved us all. Maurice and Larry Larkin, but particularly Mar Maurice. Um, yeah. Really, he, we would not be here. <laughs> I really think many of us wouldn't be here without him. And you never met a more humble guy. Never. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. amazing. He loved the airplanes. Yep. Um, Yep. Uh, A.W., and you perked up to the same thing I did. Um, Robert Klein commented that he's going to find that mirror manufacturer, but we'll put together a group buy and post it uh, the same way we're doing here so that uh, all of us who want to get that mirror for the singles can get them because I have a feeling that we're going to end up helping to sell a lot of them. Um, the uh, uh, Stephen posted something interesting that I'm hoping the A&Ps and Hans can talk to. He said, we just had new bungees installed at annual, and we've noticed a, second, a seven second count during transition. Prior to the new bungees, it was always five to six seconds. Do new bungees add to transition time? Hmm. 
It's a darn good question. Hans or uh, Jim or anybody, Jim Lynch or anybody, can you talk to that? Seven seconds is about right. Uh, remember the, the first 20 degrees of the gear swing, you're stretching the bungee. So that's going to slow it down a little bit. Then when the, the uh, arm on the gear gets past, uh, it goes over center, then it helps. So yeah, the first 20 degrees, you're stretching the bungee, that slows the motor down. And then once you get over center on the bungee, then it, it, then it helps. And seven seconds is about the right thing. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Yep, and Zach Grant said the same thing to me. Um, and so, although this is not on the top 10 tips, um, particularly when I started flying the 180 and it didn't come off the ground as quickly as I was used to, Zach Grant told me, positive rate of climb, gear up, going down, gear down. I had been trained to keep my gear down until I had no more runway left. And Zach Grant said, why would you do that? It's seven seconds to get the gear up. It's seven seconds to get the gear down. Think about your glide speed once you're up off the runway, you know, X number of feet or the, your glide ratio. And I suddenly realized he's right. Once I'm up in a positive rate of climb is established, I can pull my gear up. And if I have a problem, I'm actually going to have time to put the gear back down because the Comanche glides well. So that would be one of my top 10 tips. It didn't end up on the list because I wasn't interviewing me but that was a helpful one um, when I went to the 180. Another question from the chat window uh, just came up. Uh, if you do want the, the number to text questions to again, 617-816-8766. And even if you're not dialed in and you just can't find the chat window, feel free to text questions to that number and I'll read them in just as I would from the chat. Um, Tom Lecomte mentioned gear down speed, and Tom, I assume that you're talking about the fact that although our book value for gear down speed is 150, uh, many people suggest that you are that your airspeed be 125 or below before you put your gear down. I'm not an authority on that. I've heard it a lot, and I practice it. Would anybody who's an A and P or like Hans, who's a gear expert, like to speak to that? Uh, basically, if you're using an electric motor and you have the resistance from the air on the gear, the slower the speed means that you have the least resistance on that uh, that motor. So the slower that you can go means that you're going to get the most life out of your uh, out of your your gear motor. Also, also the uh, in a, in a twin Comanche. Uh, I always slowed it down. Uh, I slowed it down to less than 120 to get them down. Uh, but when you put it down at 150 and those, uh, the, the doors come out, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on those doors and they have bushings and fittings and everything else and they can wear out. And so uh, I always slowed it, uh, slowed it down to 125 or less. Uh, you can do it at 150. That's what the book says. But I think uh, the, the the gear doors and everything last longer if you slow it down. Good input. Yeah. I am going to. The good news is we've we've already answered some of our future stuff because uh, we're getting almost a bit late here. But um, how, how go long ahead. Is, how long does this go on for? I, I like I said, I fell into this. And it's, uh, I'm now way past my dinner time. Uh, how, how much longer does this go for? Because I've got a whole group of people waiting for me. Uh, okay, so the good news is these are recorded. And so you can come back and view the rest of it at northeastcomanche.org. It is typically, uh, we, we always say we're going to try to end at nine. And uh, usually at nine, we say, okay, we're going to try to wrap in you know 15 minutes. Um, so right now we're looking at probably another 20 minutes. I'm going to try to hustle through the rest of this and uh, we'll, we'll just end up coming back to the, uh, the top 10 tips at the next, the next time we do the top 10. Thank you. PJ, uh, there's a possibility. Why don't we uh, just do the first five tonight and then come back again, if, if maybe come back next week and finish it. 
well, right now we have Surefly coming next week and uh, Gammy, but uh, but let's try to whip through the rest of this in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. I think okay, we actually well, have a chance because we Okay. Yeah, see, see, Jay, just a comment here. Uh, just one thing that I noticed in my command tree, the, the timing of the, uh, the retract and, 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 and the extension, uh, take, yes. uh, take good uh, no, notion of it because on mine, it was getting longer and longer. And then I got a, a, a good used uh, transmission, put it on. Well, it was just like lightning to bring it up and to bring it out. And it was the electrical motor. The electrical motor was just full of carbon and dust and everything. And uh, mm -hmm. I got it rewound and everything. But you see, it, it, you talk about the bungees and all that, but also the motor itself. And that's where the, the draw and amps in, is very useful. So the timing, if it takes longer than seven seconds, uh, you better replace something because you know, you're going to have a problem. Yep. That is excellent advice. If it takes longer than seven seconds, if you're following that handle and you feel a bump or a slow, if your circuit breaker's popping, don't ignore that. Uh, these are all all really really good advice. I think we've actually already covered. Do not practice emergency gear extension in the air. Uh, Hank gave a good story on that, so we can move right along. Okay, this I believe. I, I, Mal, I had asked Malcolm to come in and speak to it, but Malcolm, what do you what do you think about just addressing the why of this rather than going through the tables and then having your own Zoom where people can come in. And you can lead them through the two power tables and uh, and how to use them for your particular aircraft. Yeah, we can certainly postpone that. This particular one here is actually referencing the, the chart that Pete made. Pete, can you put that chart uh, that you sent me up on the screen? Yeah, right. I can't do that. I'm sorry. The, uh, if I do that, I have to stop the Zoom. The Zoom recording. I'm sorry. Yep. But okay. Malcolm, if you happen to have it up on your computer, um, Pete can let you uh, screen share and you can yeah, put you it up can, if you'd you like. Yeah, you can do that. I can, I can quit the Zoom here and let you, I mean, the, the share and let you show. All right. Um, well, let's see if I can find it. Uh, this is really this uh, power settings chart that's being referred to here where you make your own um, chart is really for IFR use. I'm sure it would be useful. Uh, no, it's for times, it's but, for everybody. I mean, the person who put it in was Ross right at the very beginning because he was like, "I want best glide, I want best economy, but I wanted to just know those by heart for the altitudes that I tended to fly at." Pete's happened to be made for an IFR. Wow, I, I'd like to uh, at a future time. I, I'll talk about uh, you know thirty eight years of well, actually more than thirty eight at this point of flying a twin Comanche. And I have a, a very interesting way that I approached it. And uh, by the way, if three engine changes, well, actually six, uh, I got 3,000 plus hours out of every engine. So uh, uh, I, I'll share that with you uh, the next time. It, it's because uh, everybody's going to argue with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you can't so, beat 3,000 since major uh, with a stick. That's pretty 3, good. 3,000 for three times. So I know it works. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're going to be, you're going to think this guy's nuts. Uh, let, let's just say, say it this way. Uh, my twin Comanche, which was fuel injected, uh, I full power uh, fixed the mixture and I didn't worry about it. And I got 170 knots continuously for all those years. And the engine was beefed up because Ron Hutter built it and he built racing car engines and I bought his machine. But uh, uh, that that's it, and so I see all these charts and everything. I never used them; just full power. Off I went and uh, went to altitude, leaned it properly a little bit uh, to the rich side, and and changed the oil every uh, 50 hours for the first thousand hours, and then every 25 hours after that, and 3,000 hours per engine uh, for three different engine changes. So that's six engines. And it worked. What what Mike just said, which is basically, uh, run your engines hard, which is to say, when you take off, firewall them, and then when you get to altitude, unless you're flying very low, uh, then you can just um, you know uh, set your prop, set your mixture, um, and change your oil. It agrees with uh, what? And Matt, Mike, is that a correct summary of what you just said? Exactly. 
Yep. I, I, didn't, I didn't do this at sea level. I always climbed to altitude because I use my airplane for business. So I always was going somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yep. And there are very few times when if you firewall your engine and you get to altitude, uh, unless you have electronic ignition, in which case this advice it can change. But uh, once you're up there, typically um, your manifold pressure is going to be below 25 um, yep. inches. And so you just leave your throttle all the way in and then you, you just set everything else. That advice has gotten many like homing drivers to 3,000 sits major Mike's experiences. And that is the best cost savings you can have on your airplane is to get your engine to run to 3,000 cents major or beyond. And it is not actually uncommon at all. Yeah. Uh, An extra thousand hours is uh, a lot of savings. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. Um, a couple of text questions that have come in. Um, uh, and this is a really good one. It goes back to the gear. How often should we send a transmission to Matt Kirk for overhaul? Uh, I don't know the answer. It's a great one. Hans or can Hans or, or Jim Lynch or anybody speak to it? Um, yeah, I have to unmute, unmute myself. The, um, the test for your transmission is twofold. One, there's a, uh, there's a circular ball bearings in the front of the fixed part of the uh, transmission. And then the, as, as the motor runs, you know, it extends out, but there's a set of ball bearings in there. If that wobbles, that means that bearing is shot. Also in the back of the transmission where the motor is, there's a thrust bearing. Uh, and you can check for all of this on jacks. You um, disconnect the transmission from uh, the swinging arm assembly and you put your Johnson bar in and you, and you just do a slight check to see if there's any play. And if, if you're getting any play at all, it's time to send it to Matt. Now, just as a point of reference, a complete gear rebuild, motors rewound, uh, either you get a, du a rebuilt Dukes or you get Matt's uh, version of the Duke's uh, transmission, the whole package, you're looking at $3,500. So be, be kind to your transmission and motor. <laughs> Good deal. Um, the only other text, and all right, we're now at 9.02, just a time check. We're gonna proceed through this briskly. Uh, the information is fantastic. Because we know many people have other commitments, um, and you're welcome, we will, uh, We'll, we'll go through to 915 and then I think for this one, because it's all of us, we're gonna, we're gonna continue whatever we can't do at a future date. Um, the email to request the thousand hour gear AD is les.thomas, L-E-S dot T-H-O-M-A-S at gmail.com. I'm having you use that one because he's a very reliable coordinator. He'll collect these and then we'll, we'll coordinate with Hans Newbert. We don't get involved in these transactions. What we'll do is just collect your information and then get your, your money to Hans and get the, the DVD sent out to you so Hans doesn't have to, to spend all his time doing that. Um, back to this. Um, okay. Go ahead, Pete, to the next slide unless there are any more uh, comments on it because it's a critical it's a critical area and this is this idea of understanding these power settings in your power chart although what Mike said really is probably the best guidance and the simplest way to fly your airplane as well um, knowing your power settings charts is still a handy thing to do when it's good it's good airmanship and uh, and it's sort of comforting like when I was trying to fly it at 1500 feet AGL, because I was trying to battle really, really fierce headwinds on a long trip to the west. Um, it was helpful to me to know that I needed to fly at 26 inches and like 2300 RPM to make best speed. And if you're flying a slower Comanche, like the 180, which is still fast, but slower than, than some, you're going to be disproportionately affected by headwinds. So then you really want to fly as fast as you can. And that's, that's my top 10 tip. Any other comments on, uh, on power settings before we jump forward? And we will come back to that because Malcolm's got a terrific prezo on it. Uh, Mike Kalani here. I, I don't know how you make this chat thing work. I couldn't make it work, but I, I do have to leave and I apologize for that. 
it's, it's like I said, uh, it's, it's 10 after six and we normally eat at six and there's people waiting for me. So uh, thank you so much and I, I'm gonna leave and uh, hopefully I'll get back next Thursday. Mike, thanks for your comments. Next Thursday is sure fly, but we'll come back to this. And uh, the recording of this, um, we're gonna wrap up in another 10 minutes, will be at um, northeastcomanche.org under the Zoom link. Uh, just you know, go to northeastcomanche.org. You'll see a blue stripe across the top. Look below that and you'll see probably third from the left Comanche Zooms. Go down into that and you'll see all the recordings for all the Zooms. Well, good, um, good for you because uh, you know, the ICS people don't uh, contact me much anymore. And uh, all of a sudden you guys started to uh, send emails to me. And like I said, I just stumbled into this. So I thank you so much and, and I, uh, I, I, I say goodbye. That's all I You can are welcome. There are about six different lists being used to reach people. So one of these days we're going to find out from everybody, how'd you hear about us? Welcome and thanks for being here, Mike. See you next week. And Take thanks care. for your very good input. Bye-bye. Um, yep. So making a list of AD psych maintenance cycles like the bungees, that we just addressed because uh, if you listen to what Hans said earlier, um, first of all, the AD maintenance cycle on the bungees is technically three years. But the why is what are they doing? Like, why do you need these bungees? Um, the AD maintenance cycle on the 1,000-hour gear AD, which, by the way, is the same AD as those three years uh, bungees, which is part of where there's confusion about the 1,000-hour gear AD because it's got an A and a B part. And one part is the bungees, which is every three years. And then there's this very intense inspection you do every 1,000 uh, hours, which could be 10 or 20 years for some of our Comanches or for those that are really flying a lot, it could be five years. But they, they both start with that same, you know, ADs have a number like 77, meaning it came out in 1977, and then the month, which will be like a dash nine, and then the day like a dash one three. Um, that's, that's how the AD is listed. And then it might have complied with that part A or complied with that part D. That list is all of the stuff that's outside of the, the, the original expected maintenance for your airplane. And when it is missed, particularly the gear ADs, we can get gear collapses. And unfortunately, insurance companies are more than ready to write off our airplanes in the case of a gear collapse because, I hate to say it, but they're making more money parting out our airplanes uh, or enough money parting out our airplanes that they generally don't cry at all when they have to just write us a check for our hull value. So please <laughs> take care of your airplanes. They're, they aren't making any more of us. Um, any comments on that uh, AD maintenance cycles and why before we move on? If I can make a comment on that, uh, something that's uh, really good to do is uh, not only make a list of your bungees and the, uh, the AD maintenance, but anything that's been done to your aircraft. When I bought my aircraft 23 years ago, I set up an Excel program and put down everything that was done to it regarding ADs, service bulletins, so on and so forth, and kept a list of that, whatever was repetitive every 50 hours or 100 hours or whatnot, so that when you come up to the annual, you can reflect on that list to see what is current and when, uh, when things actually need to be done. And uh, I think it, it, it's kind of time consuming, especially high time airplanes, but uh, it's uh, worthwhile in the long run. Not only that, your advice, having just gone through this, will save all of you an enormous amount of time because if you don't do it, your A&P is required to because he has to be able to show compliance with all of that. And so it's the best thing you can do for both of you. It'll, it'll, it'll make your AD, your a &P like you better, and it'll make you have a better maintained airplane. Correct. Good job. Yeah. Any other comments? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, CJ, this is, this is Murray. I've got, um, in, in reviewing the AD list for our aircraft, I, I went through that same bungee AD, and while it says replace the bungees every three years, it also says inspect and sign off the bungees are still valid every one year. Oh, so good point. More of a more of a legal point, um, to just to make sure everybody's compliant. But the bungees are required to be inspected every one year.
been cut, you're supposed to replace them. I generally that's right. right. They're on narrow. That's exactly right. Um, uh, if you go to fa.rgl.gov, uh, you go to the menu, do a search on Piper, and then do a sub search on your mod, and it will tell you every current AD that's on that area with or terminated or whatever. And, and that, that's what I do too. But anyway, you, you can get all current ADs on the airframe, engine, and prop just by going through the AD list that the FA maintains. And it's all the current ADs. Well done. Pete, go ahead and pop to the next one. And um, our next slide. <laughs> okay. Looks like we've lost Pete. Uh, here we go. Yep. Uh, this was one from Pete Morse. Uh, originally, the request from Ross had been, where the heck are the tire pressures? And uh, it came out that um, tire pressures and also how to rig your airplane correctly are in the maintenance manuals, in the maintenance section of your, uh, of your pilot operating book. But Pete said, I'm going to do it one better. Uh, on the inside of your gear covers, because I was like, Pete, I'm not going to write on my paint. And he said, no, write on the inside of the, of the, uh, the gear covers, because when your gear's down and your plane's sitting on the ground, you can then look at what the proper tire pressure is, because it's different from the mains and, and, uh, and the, the nose. Um, any comments before we move on? This one is critical. When you fill your gas, your fuel tanks to the bottom of the filler neck, which people who are used to filling Cherokees often do, you are leaving in general five gallons, four to five gallons on the ground. To actually fill your tank, fill it all the way up to those little rings in the filler neck. And to really fill your tank, make sure your airplane is level. Comanches tend to fit tail, sit tail down and nose up. It, and, and we actually recently had an accident because somebody had less fuel than they thought. And if you think about it, if you're in a four tank airplane and you just fill to the bottom of the filler neck, you've just left 12 to 20 gallons on the ground. That's one to two hours of flight. <laughs> so I, we're, we will come back to this when we return to this topic, but it is, this is, if this is the number one advice I have because going through the NTSB statistics, I was the chair of the ICS safety committee and uh, one of the things that we were hoping to talk about tonight is a safety study done by AOPA looking at the 1982 to 1992 statistics. This is the one bugaboo for Comanches. We have fuel related accidents at twice the rates of similar aircraft and they are not because our fuel system is problematic because they did not find elevated rates of accidents that had anything to do with the airplane. It's us, the pilots. Fill your tanks, we'll come back and we'll talk about how to make sure they're full. And then change your tanks, time your tanks, don't trust your fuel gauges. Um, anybody wanna comment on this? Okay, so we'll come back and talk about this more. Um, one of the things is there are two little pegs in the baggage door. They're actually to help with CG loading, but if you really, really want to get your tanks full, literally have your passenger lift up your tail a little bit. Um, and then in addition, there's a cool little idea, which is you can, you can, put, a, you can put a stiff little uh, wire in a tube to actually get the bubble out of your fuel tanks if you really want that last tenth of a gallon. But the big thing is, Fill your tanks all the way to the top of the rings. And in fact, if you really want to make sure they're full, go ahead and fill them so that there's a little bit of fuel running out over the top. It's okay. It's not going to hurt your airplane. And when you push those um, covers on, everybody's like, your fuel's got to spill all over the place. And in fact, as they push down, the fuel spreads out in these wide flat tanks that we have in our wings. And you actually will find you don't spill a drop. So, um, but you know, you, to get all the fuel your airplane's capable of carrying, Fill it all the way to the top. Zach Grant asked me to add that we have 28 gallons usable. Somebody's accidentally got an, an open mic, if you can just check. Um, and uh, so plan accordingly. Only, you know, 
out, out of your 30 gallon tanks in your mains, 28 are usable, plan accordingly. And then um, at this point, it is 9.15. We're gonna just zip through the other slides. And um, I'm just gonna read this one. So tip number one, this is a summary. Leave your tanks full so your fuel bladder stay hydrated. Tip two, turn off your electric fuel pump when idling on the ground for cooling. Number three, monitor your fuel pressure when switching off your electric pump in the air. This is for carbureted aircraft because you may have vapor lock and if you find your, your uh, fuel pressure dropping, flip it back on again and then flip it off. Four, do learn the emergency gear extension, but learn it on the ground, not in the air because when you land after doing an emergency gear extension, your gear is not really down and locked. It's held over center by your bungees and that gets to a later tip, change your bungees every year. They're cheap, they're 20 bucks a pair uh, each, and that means a pair is 40. Tip number five, do not practice your emergency gear extensions in the air. And then next slide will get us to the next couple. Number okay. six, uh, we're gonna come back and re revisit this at a future Zoom. Malcolm's gonna take us through the various power settings at common altitudes, like six to 8,000 feet, where Comanches like to fly. Um, Number seven, make a list of your AD maintenance cycles like bungees and why. And it's possible that you'll uncover some of the things that we found here, like things that were supposed to have been done and that weren't. Uh, number eight, uh, writing the proper tire pressure on the on the inside of your gear doors with magic marker can help you keep them properly inflated and that can keep you from an unexpected blowout. Uh, number, number nine, Learn how to fill your tanks, but make sure that if you think you're going with full tanks that somebody has filled them all the way to the top of those fuel filler necks. And, and then uh, lastly, uh, you can go ahead and level the airplanes. We did have more tips. We will come back to these in a future Zoom. Uh, at this point, at uh, 9.17, we're going to call it a wrap. Uh, we're going to stop the recording. We are going to keep the meeting open in case you all want to talk about these. And I'm going to be listening and writing down your great tips.